Hi there everyone, welcome to the AHDB Strategic Serial Farm Results webinar. Um, that's a bit of a, a mouthful for this time of the day. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to make cover crops work for your business. Um, so farmers are increasingly looking for ways to improve their soil health and improve their nutrient management and cover crops are a great way to do this, but they're not without their challenges. And so hopefully we'll be able to talk you through some of the trials that have been happening on our strategic farms today and hopefully they'll help to answer some of those questions. Um, can I have the next slide please Maya? So just some housekeeping before we kick off, um, you should all be muted but if you could try and keep yourselves muted throughout the whole um, webinar today that would be great just to avoid any kind of noise interference. Um, if you do have any questions we really encourage you to ask questions throughout all of the sessions today. Um, if you want to put them in the questions um, box, um, that would be great. We'll be doing a sort of Q&A panel session at the end, so after all of the sessions. So don't feel like we're ignoring your questions, we're just compiling them and we'll get to them all at the end. Um, so the webinar today is gonna to be from 12.30 till 2 p.m. Um, we may run over if we have some really good questions, um, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. There are basis and neuroso points available today. Um, when you've registered for the event, you should have been asked for your details, but um, if you weren't, then please do pop them into the question section. Um, that means that only um, the organiser of the event will be able to see the details and we can then update them and get your points to you after, after the webinar today. Um, so just to let you all know, the um, webinar today is being recorded. Um, so if you have to dip out at any point or if you know other people who are interested, um, in watching but couldn't make it today, then we will be um, uploading this to our YouTube afterwards. So do keep an eye out for that. So this is the third in our strategic cereal farm results webinars. So we've already looked at how to use data to improve efficiency and yield. We've also looked at um, IPM and now today we're going to be looking at cover crops. Um, next slide please, Maya. So for those of you who don't know about our strategic cereal farm um, network, um, so these are our slightly longer term, um, more significant trial farms. So they run for six years. Um, we put quite a lot of research investment into them um, and we run sort of larger scale trials, but in commercial farm settings. So hopefully the results from these um, are more applicable to kind of real, real life um, farm systems. Um, so we have three of our strategic farmers with us today. So we've got David Aglin, who is our strategic farmer up in Scotland. We've got David Miller, who's our strategic farmer in the south. And we've got Brian Barker, who um, has been our strategic farmer in the east up until this year. So this um, his kind of term has now come to an end, but we're really excited to hear about the results of his trials for the past six years. Um, as you see, all of our current strategic farmers are all called David. Um, it's not a prerequisite to becoming um, a strategic farm host. If you are interested in knowing more about it um, or you want to get involved, then yeah, please do get in touch. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to start with Strategic Farm East. So we're going to be hearing from Nathan Morris from NIAB and um, Brian Barker, who was our host farmer. Um, and they're going to be giving us the results of their cover crop and soil nutrition trials. Before we kick off with them, we're just going to ask you a very quick poll question. Um, so Maya's just going to get that up and running for us. And we'd just like to know how many of you who are attending today are currently using cover crops. Um, just to gauge kind of what people's interests and expertise are at the moment. We'll just give you 30 seconds um, if you could just pop um, an answer in there and then we'll just have a look at the results. That's great, thanks Maya. Um, so it's really great to see we've got plenty of people here who have been using cover crops for a long time and we're really interested to um, hear your questions today and, and see if maybe you share some of the uh, joys and struggles of um, the people presenting today, but also really great to see that we've got people who aren't currently using cover crops. Um, we hope that this can give you a bit of insight into the sort of pros and cons and um, make you feel more confident perhaps in, in using cover crops in your system. Um, so thanks for that Maya. So I'm now going to hand over 
to Nathan and to Brian, if you guys wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves very briefly, and then, yeah, we'll hand over to you to hear your results. Brilliant. Thanks, Henny. Um, I'm Brian Barker, strategic farmer from um, Suffolk. Um, very first one um, to be launched as Strategic Farms. And one thing that I was very conscious of was the question of what's going down our ditches. Um, when we started our Strategic Farm journey, it was during the Health and Harmony consultation. This idea of Elms was very new and there was, um, yeah, lots of talk about polluter pays and things like this. And these sort of new regulations that might be brought into our industry. So I was quite keen to look at um, how we could um, investigate what was going down our ditches and um, Essex and Suffolk Water came on board and helped me um, sample a whole ream of different fields under different uh, management, under different cropping to see what was actually coming out once they started running during the winter. And obviously this winter has been fairly wet. There'll be lots of um, runoff and um, drains pumping at the moment. Um, so it was quite a, a, a good topic to really get stuck into. And so I was jumping in the bottom of the ditches on a two week cycle, um, taking about um, anywhere from 12 to 15 different samples every two weeks through the winter. And these were sent off for analysis, for nutrition, for pesticides. Um, and so we knew exactly what was coming off. This would then give us a gauge of what was actually happening um, around um, going through the soil. Um, and so we could start bringing, bringing to life a subject that is quite, um, quite difficult to understand. Um, and then the journey of cover crops started with me um, back in my monitor farm days before strategic farm. So I've been dabbling with cover crops for about nine years. I would say I have a love-hate relationship with them. They're very good at some things. They're brilliant at absorbing nutrition, which I'm hoping Nathan's going to talk about. Um, but, and they are very good for biodiversity, very good for the soil, but they do add risk to the following crop. I've had crop um, failures with due to different things, slugs um, being the main one, but also with a direct drilling system when you're trying to get on early, they can hold moisture in the surface. And I've dabbled with all different types um, of seeds and plants and rooting systems. And I've gone away from the big tap roots of oil radish and things like that to a much more fibrous root base um, because it seems to work better on our soil type um, with everything we're trying to do and trying to go for a, a smaller canopy, not these great big one, uh, big canopies that you see around with sunflowers and big oil radish and tillage radish and all that sort of stuff. Gone for a much smaller one, so I still get light to the floor to allow it to naturally um, slow its growth over winter and allow um, the glyphosate to be used in a single pass just before we start drilling it. Uh, we've dabbled with drilling on the green, we've um, sprayed it off, we've had cover crops grey, so we've tried everything. So I'm happy to take any questions at the end, um, very end, I think we'll do questions at the end of the actual webinar. Um, but hopefully Nathan's going to give us a bit of an update on all the samples that I took and I hope it wasn't wasted jumping in all those ditches, getting my um, fingers torn up with thorns. Um, but it was um, a very worthwhile exercise and, and really interesting to know what was actually coming out of our ditches and something that we've got to be very much mindful as an industry because we are our industry is costing other industries a lot more and we're getting basically penalized when we start um, asking water companies um, to clean out clean air act up if we're not cleaning our own up so i'll leave it to nathan thank you brian and i'm just going to share my screen now so as brian mentioned um i've been working with with him on looking at the water quality um, co coming out from from the field drains over the winter period and tying into as as Brian mentioned about the rotational impacts from cultivations and establishing crops and cover crops and looking at that implication across the rotation. So across the period, um, five year period of 2018 to 2022. Um, there was a lot of water samples collected. In fact, there's around 340 in total taken. And with the help of Essex and Suffolk Water, who kindly analysed them, we were able to look at a whole range of nutrients and pesticides um, being lost to the drains. And then I've been looking at perhaps some of those management factors that we can understand as to where, where those drivers are, are from. 
So as I mentioned, the, the key focus really was around the impact of cultivation and rotation on the field drains because cover crops, as Brian mentioned, have got lots of fabulous uh, advantages, but they also do have some, some challenges um, as well. And the more understanding we can have on those um, drivers, if you like, of, of both positive and negative effects, then hopefully we can get that better understanding. So really it was around understanding that interaction of how we can use uh, cover crops within the rotation to minimise the losses to water. And the design of the, of the fields at, at Brian's were, was based on the field drains in the field to look at uh, where the outflows were. So some fields had splits, so there were split treatments. Um, others were what I've defined as whole fields, um, where there was a single treatment following the rotation. But again, over that period of time, the strategic farm has been running we were able to look at that effect rotationally. So just as a, a bit of a, a snapshot across um, the whole farm, as Brian mentioned, he, he jumped in lots of uh, ditches and there was around 320 to 340 samples analysed across. And uh, this table summarised the pesticide samples for a whole range of um, materials. And I've just traffic like them. So anything um, which were green, basically fall below the level of, of um, the li limit um, that, that's required for that particular um, pesticide. Uh, those that amber have you know, some um, samples that were over the limits, um, and then the red ones were the ones where there was a higher number of samples. So you can see actually about 50% of all the pesticides that were uh, tested for were actually below the legal limits. In terms of nutrients, um, there's a little bit of a different story there you can see there that there was there was greater risk of those nutrients being lost and some of that's just as, as brian mentioned you know we're we're, we're, we're challenged now with with um, the intensity of our of our weather patterns um we do get quite prolonged um high intensity rainfall periods over that autumn winter period and where soils are left more bare or where crops have um not got that cover that we may wish for there are obviously increased risks of, of those soils becoming either directly uh, lost like nitrates that are very mobile in soil being leached out or through sediment loss, which obviously carries things like phosphorus out uh, of, the, of the system. Um, but I'll just go into a bit more detail on, on what we found. So although the whole farm had, had 340 odd samples, when I've been looking at the analysis, I've actually focused down from the 14 fields uh, down actually to 10. And those 10 fields were really driven by the number of what I've called entries, but where, where samples were taken from. So I can actually get a full picture of what's going on across rotation rather than where, where there was a relatively few samples. It was hard to know sort of where, where it started from and where, where those drivers were. So I've sort of focused on the fields that had the most entries. And that actually gave a nice design with four fields where there were split field designs where we could look at the implication of the cover crops uh, following on with the rotation and also fields with the full rotation um, across time. So if we just take an example of one of the split fields, um, so these were, were two fields, apple tree and blacksmiths, that we basically, um, you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a table there of the rotation. So it followed the farm rotation, years 2017 through to 2020. It was a um, single crop, but in tw well, prior to uh, 2020 of the spring barley, there was a, a cover crop established. And then that's when the fields were then split. So after 2020, we could then look at that impact of the cover crop under those scenarios. So you can see there in apple tree, we had a plow based system with a cover crop established. We had um, the other part field that was just left as an overwinter plough and then blacksmith's field where we had a stubble or a stubble with a, a cover crop directly sewn into it. Um, and this gave us a terrific opportunity to, to look at that uh, rotational impact. So just looking at nitrate concentration, so this graph basically has a nitrate concentration on the left uh, y-axis. Um, on the right hand y-axis you've got the rainfall and then we've basically got the nitrate concentration plotted over time. So this is plotted over those periods of winter months. So that the dates aren't continuous on the, on the X axis, but you can see they're very much driven by when the drains start to flow with the higher um, rainfall periods. 
Um, and you can see there where I've just highlighted the rotations during those periods. So the first, where you can see the blue bar being very much uh, at the bottom of the of the uh, y axes, that was in a cover crop followed by spring beans. So just as Brian mentioned, cover crops can be fantastic at taking that nitrate out of the system, um, saving it being lost if that was not in the cover crop over that autumn period. But we do see when we're following rotation, so it then went into a first wheat. For the establishment of the wheat, obviously there's a as an element of, of cultivation um, and that will mineralize nitrogen. And um, you can see there that we do get some quite high losses of nitrate during, during that period. Um, when we went into a cover crop before the spring barley, that's where we started splitting the field. So we've actually got these four lines. You can see the, the gray and the blue bar uh, line are where we've had cover crops in the two fields and the sort of orange line and the yellow lines are where we, we didn't have the cover crops. And you can see there the, the, the benefit of having cover crops um, greatly reducing nitrate. So where we had the blacksmith cover crop, really low levels of nitrate through the whole season, where we had the apple tree cover crop, there was a high level of, uh, of nitrate to begin with, but that reduced very quickly um, rather than in, in, in the other treatments, we were seeing quite high levels of nitrate above the 50 milligrams per litre uh, legal limit, mostly in that whole period. Then it becomes interesting because it was the, the spring barley was under sown with a two year uh, herbage grass. And we can see there where um, in the first year of the grass, there was some quite different uh, interactions going on, um, where particularly where the uh, blacksmith cover crop had been in the previous year, really limiting that nitrate loss. I suspect some of that that then was was um, was mineralized as the cover crop had been destroyed and breaking down. And that then, while the grass was in a fairly early stage of its establishment, that was then at risk to leaching, rather than in the, some of the other systems where the nitrate losses had already been minimised really through either the previous loss in that in the in the previous season, or where the cover crop had maintained a, a lower level of of nitrate loss. But you can see once you get to the second year grass, nitrate levels are really really low, if, if you know, barely barely on the on the scale. So. It all does depend a bit on that, that period of rotation and where those risk crops are, which I'll come back to. Just as an example of a whole field, so this was where we just followed the rotation, the farm rotation through. You can see there, slightly different rotational um, sequence. So we started with the grass um, and then it went into uh, basically winter cropping with winter wheat and winter oilseed rape. So the bad news here is again, yep, great grass is good like cover crops at minimizing nitrate losses. Um, when we had the winter cropping, either winter wheat or winter oil seed rape, we can see there quite high peaks, uh, particularly with that, as I say, that initial establishment, mineralizing nitrogen, fairly low level of, of cover, um, risking that, that loss with, with high rainfall to, to leaching. And you can see there, that winter wheat particularly, where you don't have a huge amount of autumn growth, um, is a higher risk of, of losses. Uh, and winter oil seed rape, you can see you had a high peak to begin with, but that actually dramatically reduced. So actually by the time you were getting to the, to the winter period, you're actually at, at low levels. So I suspect that winter oil seed rape with its taproot was actually better at, at sort of mopping up the nitrates than the winter wheat was. So one of the challenges that we all get as growers is, is you know, how much um, loss in terms of an economic loss will, might we expect from, from the nitrates um, entering the drains? And that's quite a difficult question to ask, uh, answer rather. But um, what we've been looking at here, and kindly Brian spent uh, a fair bit of time in one of the seasons where we actually had a stopwatch as well. So when he took the samples, he actually timed um, the volume of water that was coming out of the drains and um, from that, although those were done at spot times and it wasn't a continuous uh, flow, I've then estimated an approximate nitrate loss. So these are based on those flow rates when, when Brian took the samples. Um, there will be obviously um, variation based on um, the intensity and duration of the rainfall. So that's why it's an approximate loss rather than an absolute um, calculation. But it does give you a guide as to the sort of range of figures of this is a nitrate loss in kilograms per day. 
So anything from pretty much 0.01, so really low levels of loss, up to uh, approximately one and a half um, kilograms per day. And there's obviously some maximum there where the flows were really, where there's high rainfall intensity um, and, the, and the high highest losses there were up to around rough four to five uh, kilos per day. Now, I've just done a fairly simple calculation looking at the um, cost of ammonium nitrate, based at two pounds per kilo of nitrogen, and just put some values on that. So you can see there um, the losses that could, you, can, you can perhaps um, have from, from that, that nitrate loss. And that's partly where, as well as it being a cost, as Brian mentioned, to the water companies having to try and extract or take out that nitrate, but it's also a loss to, a, to, to growers um, with that valuable nutrition um, not being available to the, to the crop that we want to be feeding. Um, and those costs on average were around two pounds, but varied, as I say, from very low levels. And you can see there some of the either the grass or the cover crops actually had pretty low levels of, um, of losses, but it does vary very much on the rotation. Uh, and the time of that rotation as well. So for example, where the uh, cover crop had followed a spring barley, there was actually some quite high rates of losses. And that was probably associated with uh, the spring barley, Brian mentioned, um, had, we had some challenges of cover crop limiting the establishment of the spring barley. Um, the spring barley then had its um, nitrate application based on the um, expected sort of yield. Um, and, and I suspect there was some of that it wasn't quite uh, fulfilling that that expected yield so there was probably a bit more nitrogen in the system which then obviously as it went into the grass um, was, was more like, likely to leach. So if we try and sort of build those individual fields uh, together and look across um, the whole um, 10 fields that I analysed looks in terms of um, rotation so we can see here we've got the, the, the farm rotation, first wheat, second wheat, the grass, uh, either the cover crops um, or some of the other um, cropping, for example. We can see there that in particularly in terms of nitrate, nearly all crops are at risk at losses of nitrogen exceeding the um, levels um, permitted. These are all percentages. So one of the challenges with the drains, there was some various across the fields different fields had different time periods of samples collected, um, depending on when those drains are actually flowing. So that there was an unbalanced basically data set. So just to even it all up to actually allow comparisons to be made, I basically just looked at the, um, the amount of times that a given um, field exceeded a level as a percentage of the total occurrences. Um, and, and therefore these are all percentage based. So you can see there first and second wheat across the, that farm, um, there was around to between 60 and 80 percent of samples exceeding the nitrate levels. Um, again, I've traffic lighted it, so you can see the ones that highlighted the red. So nitrate is the particularly biggest concern. Um, you can see there that, as you'd expect, where you've got a higher rainfall intensity, the suspended solids, so like the turbidity of the water was affected from, from that increased flow rate, actually picking up samples uh, of soil particles rather, and that probably then carried off some of these other nutrients, and particularly phosphorus that's bound to the soil particles was likely then to be taken away. But by far the most, as I say, concern um, was really nitrate. And you can see there that things like the grass rotation using cover crops, so across, across the fields examined, um, there was 24% of the occurrences exceeded, so you're basically getting 75% of samples below the the nitrate limit where cover crops were used. So they've winter barley actually was quite good. Um, and as I said, all seed rape um, was about half. So it was, it was certainly better than some of those other um, other risk crops. And just those overwinter, I've put overwinter there, that's either overwinter stubble or overwinter plough. Unfortunately, that didn't fare very well in terms of the losses to nitrates where effectively all, all occurrences were um, exceeding the limit. So that's probably one just to watch and bear in mind. Interestingly, what I've done uh, is, is then just plotted the nitrates uh, as a percentage of occurrences, and this is on a uh, rank order. Um, so you can see there the overwinter was the, the, the biggest risk. Uh, linseed, first winter wheat, the barley, the second wheat were all above 50%. Uh, 
occurrences um, and then we start to get those uh, crops that were certainly better at reducing those nitrate losses so things like all seed rate um, the grass and the cover crops um, certainly really help to reduce those those nitrates if we look at it in terms of cultivation then that's also quite interesting to look at and we can see there that again um, cultivation has quite a big driver in terms of nitrate losses but also some of those other losses um, in terms of phosphorus you can see um, certainly had higher levels where, where either there was stubble or, or a more intense cultivation um, approach. And again, I've just plotted the nitrate, and this I thought was nice. Again, it's on the um, it's it's presented as the um, number of occurrences exceeding the, the limit, and this actually suggests that there is a trend to reducing nitrates where minimal soil disturbance is is happening. So where you've got things like strip tillage and direct drilling there certainly appear to be a reduction in that overall uh, risk of nitrates um, being lost from the drains compared to things like min minimum tillage, um, which was a more, um, a more uh, intensive cultivation or, or plant-based systems. So just to sum up, the challenges are in terms of the water quality, yeah, cover crops have a fantastic role to play. But we do have to think of that that wider challenge of where they fit, what the following crop rotation will be, and as Brian mentioned, you know we're all learning from from experiences of using cover crops where they work, where they fail, um, and I think it's just it is a it is a higher level of management uh, in terms of time uh, taken to actually look at those cover crops and to understand um, perhaps where the cover crops have impacted on that following crop establishment and be mindful of where we might need to adjust inputs like nitrogen to take account of perhaps slightly lower yield expectations um, just to re reduce that risk of, of excess nitrate losses. Um, but as I said, there are, there are certainly scenarios there where um, reducing cultivation levels uh, using cover crops, having grass as part of your rotation really does help clean up that water. Um, and then just looking at those uh, economics of the losses, um, just minimising basically the, the amount of nitrate that's in the water will obviously minimise that loss of nitrogen from your soil, from the fertility that you want to be feeding your crops. And as I mentioned, those um, crops such as grass, or seed rape and cover crops certainly can reduce nitrate losses, but it does very much depend on the previous cropping history um, and in some cases where where those uh, nitrate losses have been higher um, in the, from the previous crop. And that then follows through in the grass years, so actually the two years of grass has that longer opportunity to, to, to reduce the nitrates. Um, and so I think we just need to, as I say, Put, put it in context in that wider way. So rather than just thinking individually where the cover crop is, what is my following crop? It's actually looking at that whole rotation uh, on farm and seeing where cover crops can be best fitted um, to manage particular um, scenarios in terms of are you trying to reduce nitrate losses to water? Are you trying to improve soil structure? Um, so that was that was my presentation. So thank you very much and very happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Nathan, for that presentation. And thank you, Brian, um, for um, allowing us to do these trials and yeah, being such a um, yeah a big part of it. I actually failed to mention at the start, but Brian, you did mention it in your introduction that um, Brian was a monitor farmer for three years before he joined the Strategic Farm Network. So he's actually been a part of the kind of wider HP network for nine years now. Um, and so it's really great to have had him on board for that long and we're looking forward to Kind of going back over the farming journey that he's been on over those nine years and, and kind of sharing some of his um findings with you over the coming months so we're looking forward to that um and yeah really interesting um really interesting results there nathan it was great to have had that cost analysis as well um obviously the nitrate leaching in terms of water quality is a is a um, a massive thing and something that water companies are, are really interested in but also really important for the farmers to know what the economic impact of of that runoff is as well so yeah thank you um so yeah just a reminder Nathan did say if you do have any questions please um 
pop them in the question box and we'll get to them at the end when we have our kind of panel session. So the next session, um, we're going to be heading to Scotland. And so we're going to be talking to Fiona Bennett from SRUC and from David Aglin, who is our strategic farm um, host up there. Um, and so David has been looking at some cover crop destruction trials. And so we're going to hear the results from that. Just before uh, we do jump into that, we've just got another very quick poll question for you. Um, we're really interested to know what you see as the biggest challenges um, for using cover crops in your system. Um, that's obviously something that Nathan touched on just then. Where do you put it in your rotation? Um, and David Aglin has been looking at how to um, destroy your cover crops. So yeah, if you could just pop your results in. Um, and if you've got any other suggestions, if you can put them into the chat or put them into the question box, that would be great. Um, and we'll have a look at those results in just a second. Okay, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I think the effect on the following crop is something that we have also heard as um, quite a common um, sort of worry or concern that farmers have. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear from David Miller later, who will be touching on that a little bit. Um, and if you do have any other suggestions, we will have a look at those in the chat um, after this. It really helps us to kind of guide um, where we might look at cover crop trials going forward. So thank you for, for answering that poll. I'm just going to hand over to Fiona and David now, if you'd mind just doing a very brief introduction of yourselves and then jumping into the results of the trials. Thanks, Henny. Yes, uh, I'm Fiona Burnett, so I'm Arable Technical Lead at Scotland's Rural College. So we've been working um, with David, who can introduce himself. Um, so we're now moving into the fourth season of the strategic farm in Scotland. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Agline, Farms Manager here at Balburnie Home Farms in Central Fife. Um, we are looking at how to manage the timing of cover crop destruction, uh, particularly uh, relevant to uh, spring barley production up here, which is a major crop up here in Scotland, um, and how we can make the whole scenario work together smoothly. Thanks, David. Um, I'm not driving my own slides, so if I can have the, the next slide, please. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so as I said, we're now moving into the, the fourth year of the trials. So we've had two years of looking at spring barley uh, and cover crop management, as David has said there. And what I've tried to do today, we've been doing very detailed monitoring of soil and crop metrics. Um, but I've just tried to sort of pick out the main messages and then some of the slides and data that illustrate um, what I think are the main, the main stories. Um, but there's lots of data if, if people want to, to dig through reports. Um, in the first year of, the, of working at the farm, we were essentially just baselining the farm, getting to know the fields, uh, the disease issues uh, and the biodiversity that was there. And then in year two, we moved on to looking at establishing spring barley um, and looking at both different drill dates and different cover crop destruction methods. Uh, and the drill date interest was really that there's always somebody in the area that goes super early, there's a kind of average drill date, and then there's a later one. And it was to really see if we could work with the optimums there and look at the soil metrics that related to that. And then in terms of the cover crop, um, David tends to use a kind of home safe mix of, of oats, uh, legumes, some beans, uh, and establishes that. Uh, and the options we were looking at were, um, obviously no cover crop and then uh, the cover crop kept until just before drilling and sprayed off or the spring barley direct drilled into the cover crop. So they were our three options uh, and I've, I'll illustrate how we've got on with that um, and then what we might might change for the, for the fourth year. Um, can I have the next slide please? Uh, that's an illustration of Tile Park Field, which is one of the fields we were in this year. So 
the, essentially the plot sizes were along with, with David's operational strips, so they were kind of factors of, of 36 metres. Um, and you see there quite nicely, we've got the, um, the three different drilling dates going down the field, so um, you can see that you know, there, there's very distinct differences um, with the, the early drilling date at the bottom of the field there, um, looking much further ahead. Um, and that just sets out the type of, of randomization that we were doing. So the, the drilling dates were, were blocked because um, that was the easiest way to get them in. And then we were randomizing the different cover crop options. So there were essentially two replicates of each individual treatment. And then nicely, <clears throat> we stuck with the same protocol. And I think this is one of the strengths of the strategic farm is where we can begin to repeat um, protocols and, and generate kind of solid um, evidence on, on what works. Can I hop on to the next slide? I've used some of David's yield maps here just to kind of, spoiler alert, but to pick out the main kind of story from the 2022 season. So probably useful to remember that that was um, quite an early um, dry period um, at the beginning of the year. So drilling was relatively easy. We got a nice spread of, of drill dates there from March um, through to, to April. Um, and then it was, you know, it, it turned moister. Um, so establishment wasn't too challenging. And maybe if we just look at the Tile Park map there, which is on your right, um, you can see that we've got um, the, the top, of, top two lines uh, the blocks there are drilling date one, two, and three down the field. Um, but really to pick out the, the light blue ones there are where we sprayed off the cover crop after we had established the spring barley. And I think you can squint and see that many of those are the kind of redder, lower yielding patches in the field. So right through the season, we had that flag that the kind of establishing it into an established cover crop was, was that bit trickier. And then if I could have the next slide. Like I say, we did lots of you know, metrics through, through the season. So I've just picked out a few kind of, these are plant counts in July, um, just to illustrate what I think are the main points. And at the top of the charts there, you have um, the after, the sprayed off after establishment before the B, and then zero is the, the no cover crop options. And you see the, the three different drilling dates. Um, so you begin to see that it's the, the third drilling date, the later one, as you would expect, where um, plant numbers, plant counts are that bit reduced. You see that particularly in, in Tile Park there, and it's more pronounced where we're working with the cover crop. So again, that combination of late drilling with a cover crop becomes quite challenging, and particularly so where the cover crop was, was established at the point at the point of drilling. And then next slide. This takes us on to the yield, which I think kind of bears out that observation. So again, perhaps if we look at the tile park field there, again, you've got the different cover crop options down the, the axis there. Um, and where we've got that late drill, the, the grey bar in that established uh, cover crop, you can see that relative to the, the early drilling date, it's the one that's been most challenged. Um, so that kind of um, learning experience that, if we were working with a cover crop, it was that bit easier if it was gone before we, we started drilling the spring barley. And then if I could have the next slide, please. We were doing a whole run of, of soil assessments. So I picked out the visual estimation of, of soil structure here as something you know relatively simple um, to look at. Um, and again, up, you, you know the scoring system well, but a high score is, is poorer. Um, so if we're looking at Tile Park there, um, you can see that the, where we had retained the cover crop the longest, so that middle chart, um, the middle bar, spring barley drilled into a standing cover crop. The vest score is slightly lower, but it's equivalent to having no cover crop, and it's that cover crop sprayed off that's, that's giving the marginally poorer um, vest score. The scores in Tank Wilson Field um, we're, we're more similar and you see the variability there. But again, there is perhaps a hint that where we retained the cover crop longest, the VEST score is improved, it's lower. 
And then the next slide. Again, just picking out the, the soil nitrates, which might link to some of Nathan's observations. Um, but if we just look at the May data for the two fields uh, and the nitrates there, the spring barley drilled into the standing cover crop is that orange bar where you see the nitrates slightly reduced in the soil analysis. So again, hinting at, at some lockup from the, from the cover crop. But again, the bars there give you an indication of the, the variability. Next slide. Obviously, one hypothesis is that we could retain moisture um, with the cover crop. Um, so these are the, the water content from the, the two fields last year as we went through the season. Um, the differences are, are really, really marginal. So there's no strong effect there from the, from the cover crop in the 2022 season. And then next slide. Interestingly, we, we were doing quite a lot in the 2022 season to look at um, the impact on pests and predators. So we picked kind of two indicator pests, slugs and aphids, and then we looked at spiders and ground beetles as being kind of indicator beneficials. So here we've charted out the two fields. Um, uh, so at the top of the, the charts there, you're seeing um, the treatments where we had sprayed off before drilling. The orange ones are where we sprayed off after drilling. And then at the bottom there, we've got the no cover crop treatments. And we could begin to see that the presence um, of a cover crop, well, clearly it differs hugely between the two fields, which again, just the kind of very specific nature of, of this type of work. Um, but where we delayed spring off the cover crop until after drilling, it did appear to reduce slug densities, bearing in mind it's, it's a limited number of, of replications. And then the next slide. Here we're looking at, at spiders um, in, in pitfall traps. Um, so again, a difference between the two fields, which is you know, important. Um, but again, delaying spring off the cover crop until after drilling did appear to benefit those beneficial um, money spiders. And some evidence, we were looking at wolf spiders as well, um, that that was the same for the wolf spiders, which is the, the bottom chart there, um, although their numbers were, were much lower um, than the money spiders. And then the next one. Thanks. This is looking at the, the ground beetles. So, you know, again, um, where we were delaying off, delaying spring off the cover crop until after drilling, it did appear to have a benefit on the ground beetle abundance and its richness, richness so the diversity of species that we're seeing. But then interestingly, the no cover crop there is supporting a similar um, number of abundances. So we still have a lot to learn about, um, you know, the influence of cover crop management on um, the different species that we're looking at here. And then the next slide. Yeah, moving forward into the, the 2023 season, so how we got on this year. And again, I think just as context, this year we had an extremely wet March, um, continued into to April. So it was it was trickier to get early drilling and it was generally throughout the country, it was a much later drilling season. Um, and then post-drilling, um, once we got into May, we then went into a very dry period. So it was a very challenging year um, for establishing spring barley. And these are the two fields we were working in. So bottom boiler and strip, uh, two conjoined fields there, um, and then tile park field. Bottom boiler, um, you see there in the illustration, the, the kind of vigorous cover crop that we had uh, in some of the plots. So it remained vigorous right up until after the point we tried to establish the spring barley. And, you know, again, sort of building on the results from 2022, the spring barley established poorly where we had that very established cover crop and ultimately failed. Uh, and David had to plow it in and, and start again. Um, in the tile park field, however, the, it was almost the reverse. So the cover crop established well in the autumn, but had largely vanished by the time um, we came to drilling. And in that field, the spring barley established well. Um, but as you can really see from that picture, the main influence there was from the drilling date rather than from the different cover crop treatments. So that's kind of the background to that season. 
Again, looking at the, so we obviously didn't take bottom boiler to yield, um, but tile park, um, you can just see there from the kind of the highlights that um, those earlier drilled um, plots at the bottom of your screen there were the highest yielding. And as you move up the field, you can see the kind of increased reddening and very little influence from the, from the different um, management options for the cover crops there. And then if I can hop on to the next one. That just charts it out. So again, um, you're looking at the main influence there in Tile Park field of the, the drilling date. Um, it pains me as a pathologist to see that, you know, the, the earliest drilling date is always the correct answer at the strategic farm because, you know, theoretically we think there are risks attached to, to early drilling, but in both seasons it's clearly the early drilling date that that pulls ahead. Um, but again, you do see um, a hint that um, where we retain the cover crop, we begin to see the, um, the later drilling dates struggling slightly more. And then if I can have the next slide. Again, just picking out a few of the, the crop counts for you to kind of illustrate the, the main messages. So we're looking at a, a plant count um, in the middle of May here. Um, and you can see that we've got the, the no cover crop at the top there, tending to be the one where we've got the highest plant counts. And bearing in mind it was a challenging season, um, you know, we're up to plant counts of over 90 per metre um, for most of the drilling dates there. Um, the two cover crops lagging just that little bit um, behind when it comes to the, to the crop counts. And then moving on to the next slide. The contrast here with bottom boiler, so um, we're down to you know eight, ten, twelve um, plants per per meter here. So you see the the crop beginning to to struggle at this stage, but again, it's it's the earlier one is doing marginally better, albeit on a, a very poor scale. And again, that uh, top picture there is just illustrating the density of the of the cover crop. So that was clearly going to be challenging for the for the establishment of the spring barley. And then the next slide. Again, I'm moving into the, the soil results here. This is my, my colleague Paul Hargreaves um, out sampling. Um, and there's an illustration that's bottom boiler field where we were doing the, the soil samples. And then if I could pop onto the results. Yeah, here's the, I've summarised here uh, onto a scorecard, the kind of main treatments for both fields. Um, so we've got tile park paired with bottom boiler for the no cover crop, and then the drilled into the standing crop, and then the cover crop sprayed off. Um, and really, you know, there you're beginning to see, you know, the differences, again, tile park being quite different um, to bottom boiler. So tending to have a lower phosphorus status, a higher potassium status. And then the pH is kind of marginal for spring barley throughout. Um, but you see there from the VEST score that we're beginning to pick out a few differences. And that pretty much relates to differences in the organic matter being the main driver of that improved um, VEST scoring. So I've picked some of those out into a couple of charts, which are just coming up if we can move on. So yeah, picking up that point about organic matter. So here you see quite strongly the difference between the two fields with bottom boiler um, having that lower uh, organic matter in the soil. Um, the differences are very small um, between the treatments there, although there's a hint in Tile Park that it's where we've retained the, the cover crop that the organic matter is, is marginally higher. And then the next slide, again, just looking at soil moisture because, you know, we were thinking this would be a key driver um, of establishment for the spring barley. And again, the differences are really quite small, but there is perhaps a hint that, you know, where we're retaining the cover crop, um, the, you know, the, it's marginally higher, um, particularly where the cover crop was sprayed off there. And then the next slide. Again, looking at the potentially mineralizable nitrogen um, at the two sites, again, marginally higher there in the middle 
bit of the chart um, for Tile Park where we've drilled the spring barley into the standing cover crop. And then next slide. Just to pick out some of those main messages and where we're going to go um, next year. So yeah, drill date is, is a key driver of yield and we'll continue to look at the kind of moisture content and parameters that are that are helping to promote that that message. Um, there's suggestions there that cover crops may help um, with water retention, the influence is not huge, and it may help improve soil health metrics. We are in a, a bit of a conundrum though, because clearly that establishing spring barley into an established cover crop is very, very challenging. So while we saw potential lifts and beneficials where we had retained the cover crop, the fact that it was so, established, so difficult to establish the spring barley and yield was impacted means that that's in a treatment, a treatment where we think we've learned our lesson. Um, we're going to take that um, treatment out and then David's really interested in introducing sheep uh, to graze off the cover crop. Um, and actually that could be a really interesting um, treatment going forward where we might get the best of both worlds, where we can retain the cover crop for a good period, graze it off and not impact um, the beneficials in the same way, because clearly, you know, we're using glyphosate to take the cover crop off um, and that could be affecting you know, the, the biodiversity that we're seeing. So we've reintroduced biodiversity scoring uh, into the, the 2024 season. So yeah, that, that lesson that we've learned that direct drilling into a standing crop is very challenging to spring barley establishment. And it's particularly so when it's got another challenge. So for example, late drilling, um, and we're switching out that treatment for next year. Thanks, Henny. That's great. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you also to um, David. Uh, yeah, you made a very good point there about, although, you know, keeping the cover crop longer was great for the beneficials, if the farmer isn't able to get a viable crop afterwards, then it sort of, you know, makes it quite null. So, yeah, I'll be really yeah. interested to see how the grazing trial goes next year. That would be really interesting. Um, just a very quick question that you may, you may have touched on. I know you talked about the difference between the organic matter in bottom boiler and tile um, field, but do you know what maybe has driven the differences between the two? Is there anything in particular that you think might have led especially to that crop failure that you saw? I might direct that one at David. It may relate though to the previous crop in the rotation um, where you know there were very key differences in the nutritional status of the two fields. So I don't know what the different backgrounds there are, David. I think the my take on why it doesn't work or hasn't we haven't been able to make it work is just, there's just too much slug pressure in the bottom of the cover crop. It's a lovely harbourage for them and they just they thrive. Added mm -hmm. to the fact that with the cover crop on there, the soil doesn't warm up as quickly. Um, and it was interesting, you know, Brian was mentioned earlier the troubles of establishing crops are uh, um, into cover crops and slugs are an issue there it's just if, if we could knock the slugs on the head and that's the idea of moving across to using the sheep that the action on the rest of the farm spring cropping we tend to graze the cover crops off before sheep and we've noticed that the just the gentle padding down of the soil surface and firming it up with the sheep over the course of you know for a few days over the winter is sufficient to put the slugs off or limit their capacity to destroy the crop and the establishment um, success is is much much better amazing yeah thank you David. well we look forward to following that throughout the season and um, hopefully keeping you all updated and um, yeah presenting the results again next year um, that's great so we're going to move on to our final session of the day so we're going to be going all the way down south now um, to speak with Liz Stockdale from NIAB and David Miller, who is our strategic farm host in the South. And um, they're going to be talking about some of the cover crop trials they've been carrying out there, um, looking at the benefits of cover crops to um, soil health, and also looking at the crop performance of the following crop as well. Um, before we head to them, we've just got one final poll for you, the last one of the day. Um, we just, so David's about to talk about um, some of the benefits that he's found from using cover crops and we'd just really like to hear from you 
um, about what benefits you um, have either seen from cover crops or what you think the perceived benefits are. So just get Maya to load up the poll now. And again, if I could just give you 30 seconds or so um, to pop your answers in there. And obviously, I've only given you a couple of options. So if you have any other suggestions, then please do pop them in the um, questions box and um, we can have a look at those later. That's great. Yep, improved soil health, I thought would be the one that would come out on top. Um, that leads very nicely into our into our next session. Um, just a quick reminder, we've already had some questions come in. So thank you for those of you who've already submitted. Um, if you could keep sending your questions in, um, we'll get to them at the very end. So thanks. Yeah, handing over to David and Liz now. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I'm David Miller. I'm the manager at Wichi Farming which is the strategic farm for the south. Um, yeah, just going to give you a little bit of background as to why we actually looked at cover crops. Um, we can have the next slide, please. So the reason for transitioning to cover crops, um, this was not a list I came up with before we started to move to cover crops, but this is sort of where we've seen benefits as we've as we've gone along. So increasing organic matter um, seems to be important, especially from, from the last presentation we've had. Um, purely by using cover crops, we've seen our organic matters rise by three quarters of a percent over the last four years. Um, so we'll see how that continues. Um, yeah, nutrient retention, very much on Brian's um, presentation, accessing those nutrients, so creating a system that can access the nutrients that we're keeping, living roots, maintaining the soil biology, um, yeah, habitat provided for invertebrate species, um, that's something that is very underrated and that looks like it's underrated in the poll as well, that biodiversity has a massive part to play in what we're doing. Um, soil structure. Ecosystem maintenance, just looking at the whole of the ecosystem from the biology in the soil right through to um, the, all the nematodes and biology and stuff like that in the soil compared to the invertebrates and uh, uh, right the way up through the food chain. Um, and drainage and moisture retention, which is becoming much more important um, with the dry springs we're having. Um, but all of these things really um, amount to a much bigger picture of, of where we are with our IPM. Getting these things right, right the way through the through across the farm is very much part of a more holistic approach to the IPM. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, 2010 we started looking at cover crops and we, we drilled half a field with um, crimson clover uh, just to see what happened and we could see the, the line across the field where we tried that for the next two years. So we knew we were doing something um, which was having an effect. Um, then doing a lot more research we got into uh, multi-species and that they were much better for what we were uh, uh, for actually getting a lot more results of a vaster range of um, things that we were trying to achieve. Um, by 2015, we'd gone into no-till with a disc drill. Um, and then as we've carried on through there, 17, um, we're starting to reduce our inorganic inputs, uh, mainly fertilizer, uh, but also insecticides. We're just about um, insecticide free across the farm now. Um, and in the last five years, we've we've moved on to no seed dressings, uh, farm safe seed, which seems to be showing us good results for getting stuff established better. Um, and then uh, one of the things outside of what we're doing for the HDB is um, we are looking at, or well, we looked at a field last year where we applied no fungicides and no PGRs just to see what uh, what would happen, and, and the results were very encouraging. So that's just a very quick overview of, of what we're doing um, and I'll 
hand you over to Liz now to continue with the technical stuff. <laughs> Next slide, please. I noticed when David sent me his slides that he'd covered up all his pictures of his cover crops. So I thought you should at least have a chance to see the, those diverse and different sorts of cover crops that, that David's been up to, rather than just them having hidden behind the text. Um, so hence that slide. So if we have the next slide, please. I think one of the important things in the context of what David's been doing is that this work um, on the strategic farms actually been integrated with other work that's been going on. So David's been interested in trialing and getting involved in trialing for, for quite a long time. And some of that's been driven by this challenge in this particular catchment of the water company seeing increasing nitrates through time. And there is some indication from 2014 onwards that that might be topping out, but nonetheless, the nitrate burden is quite significant. So the Southeast Water, working with others, have been putting into place a range of trials to try and see what management practices could be put in place, especially in these catchments where these are aquifer catchments. So this is going to drinking water and also they fairly shallow so that the, the response of the aquifer to the changes of crop management are relatively quick at least they're not as delayed as they might be in the deeper chalk catchments out further to our west um, i'm just trying to work out where i'm in the country so um if we just have the next slide please the work's been happening sponsored by Southeast Water, but driven trials by FWAG Southeast. So you're going to see appearing in the in the slides here quite a lot of acknowledgement of all the really good work that FWAG have been doing, actually looking at a whole range of things in terms of what impacts cover crops have in the year in which they're grown um, on not just nitrates, but also those biodiversity indicators that Fiona was talking about, about the wider soil health. And so there's been this comprehensive soil monitoring on farm and monitoring of cover crops on farm since autumn 2020. And, and that's a new area of the, in the farm each year, sometimes in the same field, but a brand new area each year. So this isn't cumulative use of cover crops in this particular trial, but comparing with stubble and recently also comparing with winter wheat itself. So actually is a cover crop followed by a spring cereal, better actually than getting a, a, a winter cereal away. So that's a really important conversation there in the context of designing rotations. If we just then focus then on that, what that is showing us in terms of, of the water quality, obviously the driver for Southeast water. Let's have a look at the next slide. We can see some, some data here that shows, so the yellow, the red at the top um, is stubble. That's not necessarily bare stubble, so stubbles are often got some degree of, of weed population, but it's clear that in both of those graphs in 2021 and 2022-3, so over that winter period, we've got a much higher nitrate concentration, not as high as Nathan was seeing in most cases. So the Nathan's, of course, were drain water concentrations. These are concentrations within the porous cups in the soil profile, but not quite in 2021 reaching a a um, trigger or just, just around the trigger standard and, and significantly higher in 22, 23. But we see a reduction then in the nitrate concentration in where there's a presence of a cover crop and in 22, 23, where the winter wheat was growing. So actually, if we look at 22, 23, we say, well, there's, there's a little bit of a difference at the beginning of the, the season. The winter wheat gets away more slowly than a good cover crop so we've got less uptake in, in that first period but once the winter wheat starts to get going actually we've got both of those starting to do the same thing and take that nitrate out of the profile so that it can't be lost by water um, and the key here and i think we saw it in nathan's data too is that the real peak nitrate losses tend to be early in the season so it's in that early in that winter season when there's a sort of wets up and when the soils wet up that first flush it kind of sort of does that emptying out of the nitrate that's accumulated and it's really clear here i think that stubble loses more than winter wheat loses more than the cover crops but also clear that if we look in 2021 data specifically here just as an illustration there are differences too between the kinds of mixes and the impact those mixes might have on um, losses Next slide, please. So if we look at the data that was that the NIAB team were collecting, we were particularly looking at things here like the, the percentages cover, and that's absolutely backing up that evidence that's measured through the nitrate. So what that tends to suggest is that farmers who want to keep an eye on this themselves can say, well, how well is my ground cover going? 
and the better my ground cover is, cover crops 50 to 70 percent, the chances are the better I will be reducing nitrate loss. That's not really a surprise, I don't think, to anyone, because those growing crops are taking up the nutrients and stopping them being lost. They're also changing the water balance. So there's all, usually also a slightly smaller drainage water flow where there's an actively growing crop. Also not really a surprise because that crop is also transferring and moving the water in the other direction. And the photos there show stubble, reminding us that stubble is not there, but it has a, usually a green tinge to it. And um, in the north of the country, certainly not down here, but in the north of the country, we used to talk in Berwick about Berwick cover crops being actually just very good weedy stubbles because of the difficulty of getting cover crops established. And the key here is that these cover crops are established early. And I'm just going to say to David, these particular ones, these December 22 photos, those are August yeah. drilled? Yes, yeah. they were drilled middle of August. Yeah, so we're seeing that real good opportunity for these cover crops to get away post harvest. And that, I think we know from lots of work, Nathan's and others, um, for AHDB, the critical difference between August drilled cover crops in the south of England and September ones, and that becomes exacerbated um, as we go further north. Next slide, please. So we're seeing here the soil mineral nitrogen. This is the sampled soil. Fiona showed similar data. They get again now perhaps smaller differences here than we might expect, but if we just go and do the next click for me, we'll see, I hope, is that. Um, we get some some um, circles appearing just to remind me what to say, but I know what's going to happen next. So if we just do that next click, we can see that we've actually highlighted the, the mixes here containing buckwheat, but I think particularly the phacelia here that's rooting in that top soil and really stripping it, using up the nitrogen that's in the, the, the soil early in that growing uh, the cover crop growing season. So it, by November, we've got lower mineral nitrogen because we've got that very good scavenging root system uh, of those short summer mixed crops. And they're dominantly used actually as catch crops. So they're dominantly used in that slot between the harvest of usually an early winter barley and then perhaps drilling of a winter wheat. They don't, they do get left run into to be a cover crop, but they're dominantly sold in that catch crop. But what that tells us is they can get going really quickly. And that, that that's what's showing us here in this differences in the soil mineral nitrogen. Next, please. So one of the things that I didn't do that Callum um, did very carefully when he was looking at these crops was to actually pick apart both the above ground, ground dry mass to see which species were present and um, what was there, but also to take root cause and actually look at the difference in the amount of rooting and that rooting contributed by different species. And I think if we have no other take home message here, there's a real difference between the different mixes in both the amounts and the balance between the different species. There is also some similarity between the balance. So we can see the balance of the species are not far off. So in dominantly, the cover crop roots track the patterns in the cover crop dry mass. The one spoiler for that is, of course, radishes. How dare radishes grow big tap roots and mess up the nice pattern? But that's what we're seeing in the roots there. That sort of limey green colour is the radish, both in the smaller tops giving us but linked to much bigger roots. Whereas in most other cases, plants have bigger tops associated with smaller roots. And radishes, of course, designed in their own system to do that the other way around. So, but in general, we know, or we can see here, that if we've got a good establishment, good growth, we're gonna see also good associated rooting with those crops. And I think the real standout here, of course, is the difference between those cover crop mixes in the middle, whatever they are, and the stubble and the winter beans at either end there. So with the drilled crop here, winter beans, not winter wheat, or the weedy stubble, having much less both above ground, we know that from those measurements, but also therefore also much lower below ground. And we can see that impact on structure. If we look at the next slide, what we've got here are carefully photographed VES blocks, which I hope show up on your screen nicely. They show me nicely on David's screen for me. Um, and we can see those differences in root density and root types actually showing up in the VES block. So if we just get our eye in, not very many roots at all in the stubble on the left or in the winter beans to the right. And then the middle, we've got those cover crops where I think, and I've deliberately put it in the middle, I think we see that very fibrous and different root system 
of particularly the phacelia, but not only the phacelia, that summer catch crop mix, having a much more fibrous root system that breaks up the soil um, as it grows. There are the same amounts of roots in the mixes that have more radish, but they tend to be big tap roots rather than that fibrous root system. And inherently, having measured, counted, taken out of soil an awful lot of roots in my time and Callum did it for these ones, what's really interesting is that we can learn almost as much and almost as well by simply taking a, a spade and having a look and that actually those photographs tell us most of the same story that all the meticulous, meticulous counting groups did. So a reminder again to, to farmers and agronomists amongst you, those of you who know me well know I'm going to say this, it's always worth getting your spade out to have a look. Next slide, please. If we have a look at this, and this is the FOIR data here, looking now at what happens to the nutrients, we can see some really big differences between the amounts taken up, the kilograms per hectare on the y-axis, but also the amount in the plant. And in general, ignoring the mustard, we see that as we increase the amount of nitrogen the plant on has on average, we tend to take up more nitrogen. But of course, if a plant grows really well, that's what mustard does really well early in the season, even though it's got low nitrogen in the plant, it's going to take up lots of nitrogen, lots of kilograms of nitrogen out of the soil. So it's actually a balance between these two things that we're looking for, rapid growth, but also a good concentration of nitrogen. And hence, as, as David has well developed, is that move towards using mixes of cover crops that have those different strengths and weaknesses. Let's have the next slide, please. So we just go on and think about not now moving on from the nutrients and the real focus of southwest water, perhaps to, to something that, that FWAG themselves are a lot more interested in is what are the impact of these cover crops on that wider ecosystem. And we just look here again, something that you can see quite quickly with a spade, I think, when you dig cover crops, and I certainly see it, is a real difference if between stubbles and cover crops, just in terms, first of all, of the number of worms. So we just all, nearly always, when we dig cover crops, just see wall worms around those growing roots of the cover crops. And also a real indication here that it's not just the numbers of worms, but also the types of worms that are present. So in stubbles, we've got that dominance of the surface dwellers and those worms living in that top two to three centimetres, working the, obviously the stubble that's left. But as we see in the cover crops, we've got a stimulation and the support of a longer living, active population further into the winter of those deeper burrowers, which are really important for moving water through the soil profile, especially as we get those more heavy rainfall events. And those channels that the worms create are really important in moving that water through the soil. Next slide, please. Now, we know that actually, if we monitor and we don't have to monitor very hard, we don't have to use posh monitoring to see that as soon as we have a cover, we see more slug numbers. But it's really important to quantify that. And so there's some really nice data here showing the difference between cover crops and stubbles at different times, showing that on average, there is more slugs we see in the, sorry, in the cover crop than we do in the stubble. But most of the time, those differences are relatively small and relatively subtle. Now we're working on small plots here, much smaller than the plots that um, the SIUC trial was done on. And so that can, can mess things up a little bit and we can see different patterns, but nonetheless an indication as, as we might expect that cover crops might harbor more slugs. But I think really important, if we look at that in the context of the wider ecosystem, next slide please. Over the next, please. But we also need to look at this in the context of what's happening with the beneficial insects that might be involved in managing as part of their job the presence of slugs eggs, or at least that's not what they're doing, they're just harvesting them to eat, of course. But we've got predators, other beneficials, as well as those pest species here. Looking at winter wheat with those relatively no numbers, obviously the field margin, where we would expect very high numbers, but the cover crop markedly moving us towards that more diverse and more um, kind of useful, I guess, system where the predators themselves are being increased um, and the other beneficials much more so than the pests, that the numbers of pests don't increase significantly. So really important here that cover crops have a role, as David says, in his IPM strategy, as much as they do in his sort of health management or his nutrient minimization, nutrient loss minimization strategy. 
Next slide, please. What about the next crop? Now, this is the thing that NIAP had focused on monitoring for David. And we're, yeah, wasn't that exciting, was it? We were hoping that there might be some real differences. We'd seen those differences in the present of the cover-ups. The nice thing to be able to say to David is, you're not messing up your spring wheat in this context with the um, cover crop. So actually we've got no impact, no deleterious effect, whether on the crop health, the yield or the quality of that spring wheat. Interestingly, remember we were comparing with winter wheat and that's the workshop site there, is actually if we focused on yield and productivity, cover crop with spring wheat gives us lower productivity overall than our winter wheat. But remember our winter wheat didn't give us all those other benefits. So it's important that we look at this in the context of the whole rotation. Now, the 2023 data, I'm just going to show you the, some of that messy stuff like Fiona did. So we'll just see the next slide, please. This is David's yield maps that have been extracted. So the way that David Clark, who you might have heard talk um, in relation to the work he's been doing at Brian Barker's extracts yield data is is to do it into these and to present into these spots rather than into maps. So we've got a farm grid into which we've extracted the data, um, is that actually, I don't know about you, but a bit like Fiona, you can squint at that map all you like. The trials were at the bottom and at the top. I don't know whether David did this deliberately, but it looks to me like he put his trials in the worst bits of the field and left the middle bit producing as well as it possibly could, but I wouldn't possibly want to comment that you did that. Um, and if we then look at that very top of the, of the field, as we see there, that's the very careful combining. So you can see, you can pick out of the yield maps, the track the combine's gone on, which means that we can see that the, we've, David's combine driver's done a very good job of, it looks like zigzagging, but what they're deliberately doing is harvesting tracks for plots. So we can pull out of there the disappointing information that in 2023 too, there was no impact of the um, yield of the cover crop on what here is the yield of a spring bean crop following those cover crops and the comparison of what in workshop was was winter beans but the whole field yielding that little bit higher that those greens and ambers compared to the to the reds there next slide please a big question of course is that we've got this long-term impact of the integration of cover crops on the farm here and the trials that are brilliantly designed though they are, are not really looking at the impact of that long-term integration. And our best place to see that is actually just by comparing fields, because David has a field that he's recently taken under his management, which is Thai Freeze to the right, uh, which hasn't newly managed. So it's at the start of that transition David's um, talking about. And if we look on the left, 70 acres which has gone fully through the transition with the integration of cover crops but don't forget a lot of other changes too and I don't think I need to do anything else other than show you pictures of the soil to show you what the impacts of those that integration of cover crops but alongside all those other managements has been but in the terms of the quality of that soil for supporting crop growth. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you, David, as well, for um, those results. It was really great to kind of deep dive into what affects the different cover crop mixtures that are. Um, I know that someone in the chat was asking about, yeah, kind of pinpointing what effect those different mixtures might have um, on soil and following crops. So, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And yeah, thank you also for highlighting the work that um, Southeast Water and FWAG have been doing. Um, we're really looking forward to continuing to work with them and, and make the most of both of our kind of data sets going forward to make sure we can get the best overall picture um, of the cover crop effect. So yeah, thank you both. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Maya. So whilst you're just getting your final questions in, uh, we are about to do a, a Q and A session. Um, just wanted to highlight really quickly um, the cover crop guide. So this is a UKRI funded project um, that um, Izzy Eames of uh, HTV has been working on alongside the Yorkshire Agricultural Society. Um, so they've been developing um, a cover crop guide uh, for farmers. If you go to the next slide, please, Maya. And this is designed to be um, a sort of one stop shop for farmers to help make their cover crop mixture decisions. Um, and it is going to be launching at the end of this month, I believe, at CropTech. 
Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Maya. So if anyone would like to know more about the Cover Crops Guide, um, please do follow them on X, formerly known as Twitter, um, and there's a QR code there if you'd um, like to scan that, if you'd like to know more. Thanks. And next slide, please. So we're just going to go to the Q&A session now. Um, so if I could just ask all the speakers and host farmers if they wouldn't mind just rejoining, that would be great. Amazing. I'm conscious that we've only got about 10 minutes left now. We have had tons of questions, which is fantastic. So thank you so much for all the questions that you've sent through. Um, I will try and go for at least one per session and then any questions that we aren't able to cover today, um, we'll compile them and we'll try and get them out to you. We'll try and sort of attach them to the bottom of the YouTube video or make sure that you're able to access the answers to those questions somehow so they're not just left unanswered. Um, so I'll start with Nathan and Brian, if that's okay. Um, we've had a question about um, when you put up which uh, sort of soil disturbance practices had the biggest effect on nitrogen losses. I've had a question that says, can you elaborate on why you think mintill had higher nitrogen losses, nitrate losses than ploughing? Yeah, so there's always complications because there's always interactions. So um, I suspect there will be an interaction in part of it is is how um, Brian and I think Brian I'm sure will want to comment in how his rotation follows uh, and what crop establishment methods are used. So I suspect um, there were certain previous crops where um, nitrates were probably accumulated that when the cropping and the e.g. the cultivation system, the, the mintil was used, probably then uh, showed that those were a bit higher on average than plough based. But like with all things, it's really hard to go into those absolute numbers. So it's more the trend that I was really emphasising was the was the really interesting one. But it is a really interesting point to be picking up on. Yeah, I'd agree. Just it'll be the, the trend. It's not the mintil versus plough. It is, and I hate the term mintil. Um, my min till is minimal tillage, not my next door neighbours, which is a foot deep. Um, so it, it depends on following crops, everything else that um, Nathan said. Um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't pick in too much, but the, the bare minimum is what you've got to do. So direct drilling is more positive than not, I would say. So um, ploughing and deep min till and shallow min till, Will reduce, will will increase the amount that's, that's left to go away. So um, yeah, I won't pick too many holes into that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I've got a question now for uh, David Aglan and Fiona. Um, so we've had a question where you were spraying off the cover crop before you drilled the spring barley. Um, someone's someone's asked the question. So for that treatment, did you come to a conclusion on the optimum timing of the glyphosate application? We didn't. Other than before and after, we didn't differentiate and do further treatments on timing. So there's really not much to elaborate on there. I think. Mm -hmm. David, do you have anything else, or would you just agree with that? I just agree. I think there's been plenty of work done in the south that suggests that getting the cover crop cover crop dead and out of the way before you establish the next crop is a good idea. But um, we haven't done anything more than as Fiona suggested. Mm. We've also had a question um, which could be quite interesting. So you've already got quite a, a matrix of different. Uh, this is also for Dave and Fiona. Sorry, you've already got quite this sort of matrix going on of. Um, different destruction methods but someone suggested or asked whether you might trial um, rolling or crimping instead of spraying I suppose you've got the grazing trial coming up but has has any um, you know it's kind of going out to everyone whether you've considered other options like rolling and crimping um, or whether glyphosate is, is the best option for you I know people who sorry, yeah, sorry David you go I do know of people who've managed to opportunistically roll and destroy cover crops up here, but it really is, you know, do you get enough? We haven't had enough frost to cover all our cover crop area in a winter, 
so it's not reliable. Um, the crimping, we haven't, we don't really grow enough biomass up here yet. We've got to fine tune that a bit before we've actually got enough for the crimping to be, for something to be crimped. So sheep seems to be the best bit at the minute in my mind, and uh, and take it from there. Mm -hmm. And glyphosate, obviously, which and then is not bad. It's got, a tool in the box. If you've got black grass, then crimping, covering it over, is not a good idea. We've done that and pre we've rolled it on a frost. But then you still got to get the glyphosate out so you'll have one leaf black grass or black grass plants underneath and you've got to get, keep it clean mm -hmm. david miller is that something have you ever tried alternative methods we, we have tinkered around with rolling um as david Agden said it really is an opportunist thing um, if we get a minus four we get up at stupid o'clock and and go and roll something but uh Ultimately, glyphosate is always, always going to be the, the the end result of anything we do. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And sort of staying staying with you, David Miller and Liz, um, we have a question about biodiversity, and obviously you showed the kind of impact of the cover crops on on beneficials. Someone's asked if the biodiversity builds up within the cover crops, what is the impact on that biodiversity that has established when you then go ahead and destroy the cover crop? I think that's the, the next thing we've got to look at. Um, the, the biodiversity is one thing, but it's also the, um, the balance of the, the soil biology as well. I mean, all these things are affected by whatever you do on top. Um, so whether I supply and glyphosate, rolling, drilling, that's going to have an effect on it. Um, but I think the the, the longevity of, of some of these things is um, is what we need to look at next. But I think that's um, there will be some longevity there, which will be better than not doing it in the first place. I, don't know what you think. I was going to say, I, I think Fiona might be almost be the best person on the call to to just sort of talk us through that cycle of, of how that might work in terms of the cover crop management Liz yeah impact then on the beneficials and how that might feed through into the following crop so if you've grown good beneficials in the cover crop but actually then destroy it what, what does that mean yeah and that's why we're particularly interested in the with and without glyphosate here that that could be having really quite a fundamental effect on what carries forward and David hinted there that I mean slugs are the kind of major issue with the cover crop. So if we could kind of get that benefit, um, but lose the downside to that extra cover, that's the kind of sweet spot we, we would like to get to. Yeah, definitely. I mean, slugs have been mentioned in all, all three of the sessions today. So yeah, it seems to be that, that common issue. Um, I'm conscious we've only got a few minutes left and I do have a question that's come in, which is for all of the panelists. So I'll, I'll finish with this question and then I'll go through each of you and get your responses. So someone's come in and asked, um, so we can obviously see these benefits from cover crops in terms of reduction in nitrate loss. Um, but apart from that, there is this kind of increased risk um, on the following spring crop um, when established on heavier soil types. So um, the person asking the question is concerned that the nitrate message might drive a policy um, you know, having compulsory cover crops, um, some of the SFI standards, et cetera. Um, but perhaps there won't be that balanced discussion around following crop losses. Um, so if we could maybe start with David Miller, only because you're on the left-hand side of my screen, if you wouldn't mind um, kind of giving your thoughts on that, and then we'll go to the others. Um, it, I think one thing we've learned, we haven't used cover crops for, for 13 years now, that. Uh, it's it's very much part of a system. It's not something you just take out and, and look at in isolation, or it's, it's it's better not to look at it in isolation. That actually, with the direct drill and, um, and and the diverse rotation, we can see a lot of a lot of other benefits to it. Um, and I think that um, over the years has really shown that we're increasing the the, the soil. Uh, the, the soil health is a very wide term, but uh, the, the friability of the soil, how it reacts to rain, how it reacts to um, you know, lots of sun, we're building a lot more resilience 
uh, the sword has become much easier. It, it's become much harder to get completely wrong, which was very, very easy in the first few years. Thanks, Dave. Um, Brian, if you wouldn't mind going okay, next, because you're next on my screen. Yeah, I think with everything we've been doing over the last six or well, nine years now, all the way along, we've been in constant communication with DEFRA. Um, we've had DEFRA out on a number of occasions, and they are aware of the risks that cover crops bring into it. But they are also aware that the idea that cover crops do add a lot of things down the line, not necessarily just in food production. So. I think DEFRA are aware, and that's why it's very much of a carrot approach from them, not a stick. And that's why they're being SFI, um, um, countryside stewardship offerings. Um, there's obviously the grants to um, increase the number of um, direct drills that, you, that farmers are using in the countryside now. So it is very much a softly, softly approach at the moment. I can't see it really going to being compulsory for all over winter ground because in some scenarios it's just can't you can't do it uh, when you're looking at rotational plowing for pests like black grass and brome and things like that that we see with it with a, with a reduced tillage system then you have to do some of these things at some points but as david said it's, it's a system approach if you can make cover crops work there's lots of benefits but it does add risks to your crops afterwards but I, I totally see that, um, I've, and every time I've spoken to DEFRA and we've had them out on the farm, we make them aware of the risks. And that's why these trials that strategic farms and modern farms are doing across the country, you need to be able to communicate that to the wider audience. And that's what we're doing. It's not just peers in our farming world, but it's also politicians. They know about the strategic farm. They know about um, all the work ASDB, NIAB and ADAS and people are doing. It is all being done, but we need more farmers to talk about their experiences. And when they see a DEFRA official, just explain that there are risks associated with all this, but that we know the benefits, and that's why we're trying to work to a system that's more regenerative. Yeah, great. Thank you, Brian. And great that you've had yeah, DEFRA engaging with you on that as well. And yeah, just wanted to go to David Adlin as well. I know obviously you've experienced um, the loss of a spring crop uh, in one of your trials. It'd be great to hear your, your view on that as well. Um, yeah, thanks, Annie. It's interesting. Obviously, we haven't quite got as far as you guys in the south with our um, next stage of environmental um, regulations or what options we have from stewardship point of view. Um, but actually, I was in France last week with Base UK. Um, anybody listening who's not a member should join. Quick plug there. Um, visiting farmers growing cover crops, and okay, they've got some big climatic advantages over over the UK and even more over us up here in Scotland. But the principle was standing that they, by law, they have to grow cover crops after every cereal um, and they get no funding, no payment for it. You've just got to do it. Um, and they seem to be turning that around into something quite positive um, in that they're, they're a lot of work there to calculate, like Nathan's been doing, how much nitrogen's in the, in the cover crops and how much is getting cycled around and they've just turned it into it's a process of harvesting nitrogen and fertility um, and what we learned slightly was that we get bogged down personally get bogged down being concentrating and wanting no till to work too much and actually the positive in the cover crop could be recycling the nutrition it's obviously a beneficial and an environmental benefit on top of that throughout the winter but when it comes to establishing the following cash crop perhaps we'd don't want to be too evangelical about it and we've decided here just in the last few days that actually if we need to do a little bit of shallow cultivation in the spring to um, facilitate the successful establishment of a spring crop then that's maybe a uh, one thing that we just have to bear with um, if it makes the economics stack up a lot more if we can get more cycling and nitrogen and get the more success from the cover crops as a result so I'm not worried about it at all if, if that becomes a driver for for, for um, policy up here in the future. We'll make the best of it. Yeah, thanks David. I, mean, I think we're learning more every day about how best to have cover crops in our system. So hopefully, yeah, in, in the next five, ten years, we'll, we'll know more. And I know that you guys are really helping in, you know, uh, helping others to learn um, by doing the trials yourself. So yeah, thank you for your for your help with that. Um, 
we have now run out of time. I appreciate there's still lots of other questions that haven't been answered, but we will try and compile those and, and get those answers out to you by whatever means possible. Um, and so I just wanted to finish by saying thank you so much to our speakers today. So thank you to, to David Miller, to Liz Stockdale, to Brian Barker, Fiona Bennett, Nathan Rice and David Aglin. Um, thank you for all your help and all your work in the trials over the past year. And yeah, we look forward to um, the next season coming up. Um, Maya, if you wouldn't mind just popping to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so yeah, this is the end of the cover crops um, results webinar, but just let you know that next Tuesday um, we'll be joined by Joel Williams and he'll be um, joined by some of our strategic farmers and Adrian and Anna from HDB. And they'll be talking about how to improve um, nutrient use efficiency. So do tune into that if you're available. But as I said, all of these will be available on our YouTube. And thank you all very much for joining us today.